Uh, well, good morning, church. Good morning. And what a great morning of worship. Wow. And being in God's presence and just worshiping Him. This morning, we're beginning a brand new series. I'm excited about this series. It's a series called Better Together. And, and it's so true, right? Because we are better together. And, and so often in this individualistic mindset that our whole society has, we can kind of think it's all about us. But do we realize, hey, we're called to be a part of a community. We are better when we are together. Now, I know some of the guys in the room are excited because just a few weeks, football will kick off and it's going to be a great time and bring it back. We're excited about that. But you know, it's, it's crazy to me how much publicity, right, the quarterback or the running back gets. And it's like the team rises and falls on the quarterback and the running back. And yet, a quarterback or running back is going to get destroyed if they don't have an offensive line, right? They're going to get destroyed if they don't have somebody to throw the ball to. So it's not just about the individual. It's really about the team. We live here in Music City, USA, and uh, we have a lot of entertainers and people who got, and they will tell you it's not just their talent, right? It takes a team. It takes people to write the songs, produce the songs. It takes people to make those things happen. It takes tech team, and it, it takes a team. You know, there's can be great soldiers. There can be unbelievably gifted soldiers. You can be Jean-Claude Van Damme. I don't know who you are, but, but you can be out there. But the fact is this, you may win a battle, but you are not going to win a war. It's going to take an army. It's going to take a group of people. It takes people being around you. And what happens in our lives is we grow up knowing this, right? We grow up as kids knowing how important family is and how important our parents are and how important friends are. We grew up playing sports and we'll high five guys and growing up playing basketball, and baseball and all this. But somewhere along the way, we get into high school or college or out and we think it's all about me, right? I've got to make it happen. I've got to do this because I did it my way, right? We sing the songs about it. We talk about pulling it up by our bootstraps. And somehow we come back into this mindset of American culture that it's all about me. And what happens is that spills over many times into our spiritual life. And we think, oh, I just got to go and figure this out. I got to go make this happen. When all along, God has created us for community. All along, God has said, this is where it happens when the body of Christ. You see, our God is a communal God. A Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Trinity, three in one, right? You know, Jesus prayed for you. If you go to John 17, Jesus prayed. He prayed for himself there. He prayed for his disciples. But then he looked down through the quarters of time, and he prayed for everybody who would believe in him. And he prayed this, I pray that they would be one. I pray that they would know how much they need each other, how much they need me, but how much they were created to be together. And aren't you thankful for the people in your life? Aren't you thankful for your family? Aren't you thankful? I know no family's perfect, right? But aren't you thankful for people that are there for you? Aren't you thankful for friends? Aren't you thankful for church? Because we are truly better together. In this series, we're going to talk about what it means to worship together. We're going to talk about what it means to, to reach out together. We're going to talk about what it means to grow together. We're going to talk about what it means what, to serve together and to share life together. Because the fact is, spiritual growth happens in community. And for us to really invest our lives in knowing God and locking arms with one another and living out the calling that He has for us. Because that's where we become all that God desires for us to be. We're better together. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now, I love Acts, okay? Acts stands for the Acts of the Apostles. It is awesome. We're going to dig into God's Word this morning. If you're here at Franklin and you don't have a Bible, we have a free Bible for you back there. If you want to just go grab one, they're back by the poles. Put your name in it. It's yours. You can have it. If you're watching online, pull up the scriptures on version. You can take notes on there as well. Uh, also, we'll put the scripture on the screen. But I want to just give you a little background before we dive into our text for the day. And this is kind of our theme passage for this series. But if you go back to the very beginning, I mean like very beginning, all right? When God created man and God created Adam, and then he looked at Adam and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. Isn't that interesting? And God creates Adam, you know, and then he says, hey, wait, it's not good for man to be alone. So he created a partner, a helpmate named Eve for Adam. But he already we see that in the garden. And things were great for about two chapters, right? And then you get to chapter three in Genesis and they're like, God, we really don't want to do it your way. We want to do it our way. We want to make it happen on my own, right? I don't need you. And so they go and they take 
the fruit, and all of a sudden you have holy God and sinful man. But all of the Old Testament then is leading up to the Messiah. All the Old Testament is God wooing his people and drawing his people back to his heart and God coming to us. I mean, how incredible is that? What a remarkable truth. Even in our sin, even in our total depravity, God sends his son for us. So all the Old Testament, remember Abraham, our incredible study from the summer, Abraham, I'll make you into a great nation. Everything is pointing to the Messiah. So when you come into the New Testament, right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament, it's all talking about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And all of history is about Jesus. Old Testament looking back, all of us looking back, you know, everything's looking at Jesus and pointing to Jesus. And Jesus comes along in the first four books and talks about his miracles, his teachings, and then he dies on the cross to pay the price for our sins. But that's not the end of the story, right? Because Jesus then conquers death. He borrows a tomb for three days and gives it back because he is alive. And he conquers death and makes a way for us to have eternal life with God. And now sinful man, because of the grace of God, becomes redeemed and restored. And now when God looks at us, he doesn't see all of our sin and our depravity. He looks at us and when we are in Christ, he sees us as holy and righteous. Praise God. Now Jesus had told his disciples, hey guys, listen, listen. He said, there is one greater than I that will come. Now, I'm going to conquer death, right? And then I'll ascend back to heaven. But there's one greater than I. And I'm sure the disciples are going like, one greater than you? I mean, are you kidding? And he's like, no, no, trust me, trust me. And Jesus ascends into heaven. And so 10 days after his ascension, they're gathered together at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And there's about 120 believers at this point, And they're all together. And the Holy Spirit comes. Now, the Holy Spirit is greater because the Holy Spirit indwells the believers, Right? Before Jesus, right? Incredible, awesome. And now the Holy Spirit coming. And so Peter stands up and preaches at Pentecost. 3,000 people believe. <laughs> All right? So the church goes from 120 to 3,120. I mean, you talk about church growth. I mean, it was enormous, right? And so here, 3,000 are baptized. And then look at verse 42 through 47. And guys, this is incredible. When we planted Rolling Hills 14 and a half years ago, this was like our model. We said, man, what if we could do church like this? This would be awesome. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. I love that. It's like they were going, man, I can't wait to see what God's going to do today. You know, God's going to do something. Everybody was just so excited. I can't wait to go and worship him. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. I mean, they're seeing people healed physically. They're seeing people healed spiritually. They're seeing life transformation happen. They're seeing marriages saved and redeemed. I mean, it was an amazing time. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common. Right? They were on the same page. They had the same purpose. They had the same calling, the same mission. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Now, that doesn't mean that they were like in a commune, okay? It doesn't mean like, you know, they just kind of sold everything and kind of had lived off the land in this one commune. It means this, that when they saw a need, they said, hey, if I've got a possession, I can sell it and I can meet that need. It means that they realized that people were more important than possessions. <laughs> it means that they wanted to invest in something that was going to last for eternity, and not just something that was here today and gone tomorrow. They saw the value of all people. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Oh, don't you love that? They couldn't wait to be together. They couldn't wait to just lay. They were glad. They were sincere. They were authentic. Praising God, right? Worshiping God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Well, of course, who wouldn't want to be a part of this? Right? I mean, they're like, hey, I want to come. Somebody invite me. I want to, I want to go to this church. I want to be a part of this. They couldn't wait. And we're going to see that last verse next week. But man, it's so powerful and so true and what God wants for us. But a couple of things I want you to note here. Number one, it says in verse 42, they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. See, this wasn't just a hobby for them. This wasn't a part-time, hey, if there's not a better offer, then hey, well, maybe we'll go and be a part of the church, you know. This wasn't convenient Christianity. This was committed Christianity. <laughs> this was, 
hey, we're in it to win it, right? We are in this. We are committed. We are involved. They devoted themselves. And the second thing I want you to see is this. They devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching, the Word of God, right? So the Word of God, and to the fellowship, the community, a part of the larger body, to the breaking of bread, that's communion, right? And to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. Now, what is that? That's worship. <laughs> that's worship. See, when we say the word worship, a lot of times what we think of is we just think of singing, right? But worship is more than just singing. Our terminology can become our theology. And, and we'll say, well, you know, we have the worship part of the service. It's 20 minutes of singing. And then we have the teaching part. And, and we kind of get into that mindset, like, Worship is just singing. But worship is so much more than that. Now, I know we all love to sing, right? I know, I mean, you know, may not be like I like, I like to sing on stage kind of person, but you probably like to sing in the shower or you like to sing in the car when your favorite song you're singing. I love to sing. I do. I've tried out for the worship team multiple times. I never make it. I don't know. You'd think I'd have some pull with Leo and Danielle, but I can't ever get onto the team. But I love to sing. I love to sing. And there's something about that, us responding. But worship's even more than that. Worship's even bigger than that. And for some of you, you're like, well, that's great because I'm not that, you know, amped up about singing. So I'm so glad it's more than that. And sometimes we talk about heaven and people have this misconception about heaven. They think it's going to be like this eternal song service. Like it's the best hits of, you know, we're going to sit there and the Gregorian chants are going to happen for a little bit. And then all of a sudden there's going to be hymns and there'll be worship songs and there'll be some other, you know, language. And we're going, wow, eternity. Awesome, you know. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you right now, heaven's not going to be like that. In fact, we're going to do a series on heaven in September and it's going to blow your mind. I'm telling you, we've been studying, praying, preparing for months and reading. Heaven is about worship, but worship is so much more than singing. I love this definition of worship. Worship is our response. Worship is our response, right? That's why it wasn't just singing. It was, hey, communion. It's prayer. It's the word of God. Worship is our response. Now notice this. Both corporately, all together, and individually. See, you have a part to play. When you come in and you worship, we worship together, right? Both corporately and individually. To God, there's always an object of our worship. For who He is, His character, His sovereignty, His grace, His mercy, His love, and for what He's doing in our lives. So we come and we respond back. We say, God, thank you for who you are. And thank you, God, for what you're doing in my life. And aren't you thankful today? I mean, you look around. You think about your family. You think about friends. You think about the opportunities we have. You think about where we live. You just thank you, God. That is worship. Worship is pouring our hearts and lives out to him. And we do that together. Now look down at verse 46. Where did the early, early church worship? Well, it says... <laughs> Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes. So the early church worshiped in the temple courts and at homes. Now what is that? That's large group, small group. <laughs> isn't that right? I mean, isn't that what they're doing? Right? They had corporate worship. They would meet in the temple courts. And they did that because if you go back in the Old Testament... When the children of Israel came out of the land of slavery and, and God met them and God said, hey, build this tabernacle and I'm going to have daily sacrifices because I want you to come and worship me. Hey, remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. I want you to come and worship me. Hey, there's going to be three feasts each year. No matter where you're living, you come and worship me. And so that's what they would do. They would do that at the tabernacle. They would have a corporate worship service like we do, like here. They would gather together. In fact, did you know the book of Psalms is like the songs that they would sing in worship? I mean, we have a lot of the songs that they would sing. Uh, I'm going to put up Psalm 100, and let's just say this together. Are you ready? Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us. And we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. 
Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Did you hear that? Know that the Lord is good. That's what they would sing at the temple. That's what they would come and they would worship. Hey, we are his people. There is a corporate nature to this. We are better together when we worship together. And so when the Holy Spirit comes and the early church explodes, they go, hey, we're used to go to the temple. We're going to go there and worship. Now they understood the deeper meaning though, right? They understood from the Old Testament how everything was leading to the Messiah, Jesus. So they would go for Passover and they would go, oh, Jesus is our Passover lamb. The blood of Christ covers over our hearts and the death angel passes over. This is awesome. They would go for the Feast of Weeks and go, oh, Jesus is our provision spiritually, physically. He provides for us as we bring our grain offering, as we bring our offerings. It's him, right? They would go for the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, God is our provision. Jesus is provided for us. He is our deliverer out of slavery. So they saw the deeper meaning, but they talked about corporate worship. Now, as the church expands and grows, all of a sudden, churches start popping up all over the Roman Empire, right? You got Galatia, Galatians, Corinth, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Philippi, Philippians, Ephesus, Ephesians. So, so you see churches are going over, but they kept this pattern. Large group, small group. We still do this today, don't we? We still do this today. Right? We have corporate worship on Sunday mornings. That's what we're doing right here today. Praise God. But we also have community groups that meet in homes. Because you need both. When we come in here, we're better together. But when we share life together with 12 or 15 people, we really can get to the heart of what's going on in our lives. And that's when worship comes out. Uh, Lisa and I, we've been leading a community group for 14 years. And ever since we planted Rolling Hills, we just said this is a priority for us. And every Monday night, right, we, we lead a community group. And with school starting back, we have new groups that are starting. And I encourage you to be in a group. Jump in. Because it will make a difference in your life. It's made a difference in my life. Having people to walk through life. And some have become some of our best friends. And it's impacted my marriage, impacted my kids. But you see this. We need this. Jesus took 12 men, right? It wasn't just one-on-one. -on -one. He took 12 because there was community there. And he shared life together. So I encourage you. Hey, be a part of a community group. We believe in this so much. Next week when we go to three services, 8.30, 10, and 11.30, our children in children's ministry, 8.30 and 11.30 are small groups. Amazing teachers. Many of you teaching fourth grade girls or second grade boys and, and pouring into them. But at 10 o'clock, there's a corporate worship time. And so kids are learning, large group, small group. Kids are learning corporate worship. I have an eight-year-old, uh, Kate, and she, she loves to sing. And she comes up and she says, Dad, you know what is the best Christian song of all time? I'm like, wow, you're eight. Your extensive library of Christian songs, you know. And she's like, Dad, it's oceans. I just worship with oceans. I love it. And I'm like, that's awesome. You know, I love that she is learning to worship. That's important. Middle school, small groups, come in and worship. High school, worship one, serve one. So for all of us, seeing this pattern of how we worship together and how we grow together. Now, worship is our response, right? And we respond back to God. And when we do that, it's important. Hebrews 10, 25 says this, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So the writer of Hebrews was saying, hey, there's some people that are saying, hey, we don't need to go to church. There's even people today that would say that. People would say, you know what? I can be a Christian, but it really doesn't matter if I go to church. And I go, whoa, wait a minute. I don't see that biblically. <laughs> I mean, really, you look through the New Testament and all the believers were a part of a church. They were plugged into the body. But many times as we grow older, we go, life gets busy. I've got all these things happening. And so the writer of Hebrews says, no, no, no. Let us not give up meeting together. We need this, and all the more as we see the day, and day is capitalized, approaching. That's the day of Christ. We are closer to Jesus' return today than ever before. Think about that. I mean, ever before, right? It, Jesus is coming back, and will we be ready? Worship keeps us focused on what 
really matters. Worship keeps us focused on what really matters. Because there's a world that wants to distract us. There's a world that wants to say, hey, come do this and do that. And, and we are tugged all the time into different things. But when we come here, we're able to focus on what really matters. Worship is something so important in our lives. Jesus talked about this. Uh, Jesus, if you remember in John chapter 4, uh, Jesus was going from Galilee down to Jerusalem. Now, if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, go. Because I'm telling you, this is like the Bible comes to life. But Jesus up here in Galilee, most Jews would walk around Samaria. They wouldn't even walk through Samaria. They hated the Samaritans. Hated them. Right? And the Samaritans hated the Jews. But Jesus would walk straight through. Why? Because Jesus loves all people. I'll, I'll just let that hang there for a second because as Christ followers, we're called to love all people. That's important for us. And sometimes we can get caught up in a world that judges everybody or puts people in different categories. Uh -uh. As a believer, we love. We love. So Jesus comes down and there's a Samaritan woman, okay? Now back then, I mean, women wouldn't talk to men. And Samaritans wouldn't talk to Jews. And so here we go. We got some divides, racial divides, gender divides, right? And Jesus engages her in conversation. And she quickly realizes, whoa, wait a minute. This guy is like a prophet, okay? This guy knows what he's talking about. And she asked this question. She said, you know, us Samaritans, we worship on this mountain. And you Jews worship over there in Jerusalem. Where's the right place to worship? And Jesus all of a sudden takes it from a place to the heart. See, worship's not about place, it's about the heart. And Jesus tells her this. He says, a time is coming. And in fact, I'm here. And now is the time. <laughs> when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. These are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Jesus said, listen, listen, listen. It's really about the heart. See, I want you to, I want you to stay in Franklin all your life. I want you to stay in Spring Hill. I want you to stay, you know, in, in Brentwood or Nashville. But at some point, you may move. Now, I pray you don't because I want you to be here because I love being together, right? But whenever you do, if you do, there's other churches and there's places in the world. But you get involved. You plug in because you will grow. But what God's getting to is this. It's not about the place. And ultimately, that's what you see in the early church as they start to expand out. But it's about the heart. Is God being worshipped in your heart? Are you drawing closer to him? Are you responding to him with your heart and with your life? Is it more than just singing? Is it more than just one day a week? Is it who you are? And one of the most amazing people in the Bible to me is a guy in the Old Testament named Job. And a lot of people get to the book and they think it's Job, but it's really not Job, it's Job is his name and this guy there. And Job, I want to tell you, unbelievable. This guy was blameless before the Lord. He loved God with everything and, and God blessed him. I mean, you look at Job's life. I mean, he was blessed. I mean, he had children and he had men servants and maid servants and livestock and he was wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. And Satan comes along and he says to God, well, you know why Job worships you, God. Because you've given him all this. I mean, if all this was taken away, do you think Job would really worship you? And God goes, yeah, because I know his heart. I know what he values. And Satan goes, well, let me, let me try. Let me do it. He goes, okay. Test him. And so one day, Job's sitting there, and a servant comes running up and goes, Job, 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 you wouldn't believe it, it was the Sabaeans, they just came and attacked, and, and they took all the oxen, and they took all the donkeys, and they killed all your servants, except I, I escaped. And while he was saying that, a, another servant comes running up and says, Job, you wouldn't believe it, but a fire happened, it broke out, and all the sheep got burned up. All your sheep and all the servants died except me. I'm the only one who escaped and I came to tell you. Oh, and another servant comes running up and says, Job, you wouldn't believe this, but the Chaldeans, they attacked on this other hill and they took away all your camels. They're all gone. I'm the only one who escaped. And while he was saying that, another servant comes running up and says, Job, your sons and daughters, they were at a party and the, the roof of the house caved in and they all died. And I'm the only one who escaped. And I came to tell you. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, just the devastation. He just utter devastation. And Joe wept. 
But then it says this in Job 1, verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. And then he fell to the ground in worship. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wow. I got to tell you, that's a whole different level. That's a whole different level just to say, God, I worship. Even when it's hard, even when I don't understand, even when I'm scared or afraid, I'm going to worship. You see, for Job, God was primary and everything else was secondary. And what can happen in our lives is everything else that secondary can become primary. And we can begin to worship other things. So what is the object of your worship? Who or what is the object of your worship? And if it was taken away, could you, could you still worship God? Is he enough for you? Because that's the call that God has in our hearts and in our lives. You see, individual worship impacts corporate worship, and corporate worship impacts individual worship. It it just goes together. And as you and I prepare our hearts and we come in to worship, it impacts other people around us. Our worship impacts, individually impacts the body. In the Old Testament, there was a guy, David, right? And David wrote many of the Psalms. And David, man, he loved the Lord even from a young age. The guy was writing worship songs to God. The guy, the guy just, he just loved the Lord and he became the king. And the dude is a man's man. I mean, he is a warrior. He's a fighter. He knows God gives him victory. He wins every battle he fights. But he always keeps God first. And one day they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And I mean, it is a big processional. I mean, there is a royal party happening. And David is leading the way as the king. And all of a sudden, he's just overcome. He's overcome with worship because he realizes what God's done for him. He starts to think back and just how God's delivered him and God saved him and how God has taken care of him. And the guy just begins to dance. I mean, he starts dancing before the Lord. He's just going to town, just like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And the outward expression of that worship, God, it's all you. And I mean, this big, strong military guy is just praising God. Well, when he gets home, his wife's like, wow, you really distinguished yourself today, didn't you? I mean, how embarrassing. You're the king. You ought to be just like royal. And I love David's response. (laughs) David says, I'll become even more undignified than this. (laughs) I'm going to worship because of who God is and because of what God's done in my life. I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship. Now, I want to tell you that impacted this family. That impacted the country. That impacted the community. Israel went to a place it had never gone before. I mean, man, it would just prosper under David's leadership because he worshiped the individual impacts the body. And dads here, when you, when you worship, when you're in the word, when you're praying, you impact your family. And moms, you impact aunts, uncles, friends, neighbors. You impact others when you focus on the Lord and when you worship him and keep him as the priority. But the converse is true as well. And when we come together as the body of Christ, I pray that this time inspires us to live it out individually. I pray that this time of studying God's word, singing songs, or praying our Father, corporate, plural, together, inspires us to go be the men and women God created us to be. July 20th, 1969. Many of you guys know that date because that was the date that two men stepped foot on the moon. Something that everybody thought was impossible. But when the Apollo craft landed and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped out and walked on the moon for the first time, did did you know this? That Buzz Aldrin was an elder at his church in Texas. And he went to his pastor before the flight was to happen. And he went to his pastor and he said, I want to do something significant for the glory of God. 
and they prayed about it. And Buzz Aldrin took a communion wafer and he took some communion wine. And when he stepped onto the moon, he told NASA, my church back home is praying for me and I'm gonna take communion right here. And NASA said, well, we're gonna shut off the broadcast because back then it was Madeline Marie O'Hare and it was all the atheism and all that. And they said, he said, that's fine, you can black it out. But I wanna tell you, I'm taking communion. And he quoted John 15. Where Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in me, remain in me. And one of the first things that ever happened on the moon was Bud Aldrin worshiping God. Christ's body broken. Christ's blood poured out for the glory of God. How incredible to think that this man is worshiping the God who set the sun and the moon and the stars in their place. And I don't know what's gonna happen in generations to come. There may be people living up there one day, but to think that God has already gone before and worship has already happened there. How amazing. And I pray this. I don't know if you'll ever step foot on the moon one day, but hey, whether you step foot on the moon or whether you step foot in your house, which you will do this afternoon, or you step foot in your office tomorrow, or you step foot into a subway or McDonald's or wherever you go, that you go and live a life of worship. Romans chapter 12, verse one says, therefore I urge you, dear brothers, in view of God's mercy, right? Your response in view of God's mercy. Look at what God has done for you. And your response is this. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. That everything in me for the glory of God, God, I want to live my life devoted to you. So what do you worship? I mean, think about that. Where do you devote your heart? Where do you devote your time? Where do you devote your energy? Where do you devote your finances? Where do you devote everything in you? Jesus told us this, where two or three are gathered, <laughs> there I am with them. See, God's presence demands a response. And we are in the presence of God this morning. Jesus is here with us. So will you worship him with all your heart? Will you be honest? Will you be authentic? Maybe, maybe you would say, hey, God's not primary right now. There's some secondary things that have taken over my heart. There's some things that I'm worshiping. There's some things that I'm devoted to. And would you say today, if it was all stripped away, God, I'll still worship because you're enough for me. And I can't do it alone. God, I need you. And God, I need others around me. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. And here's the call today. And it's a call to worship. And it's more than singing songs. It's living our life for the glory of God. So this morning, would you just look at your heart? Be honest. Maybe there's something else that's come in. Maybe it's a job or a career. Maybe it's other things. You know, Satan just tries to get us isolated, pull us away. Pull us away from God, pull us away from community. But guys, we need it. And so this morning, would you respond? Maybe there's something that's gotten a foothold. And today, you just want to be honest and say, God, I want to be all yours. Holy and completely yours. God, I'll worship. So Father, here we are, <laughs> your people, your disciples gathered in your name, Jesus. And Father, we're coming back to the heart of worship <laughs> because it's all about you. And this morning, God, we just declare that we will worship you regardless of what comes in life. God, we are gonna be devoted, fully committed. So this morning, God, we put a stake in the ground to say we are yours. 
the sheep of your pasture, the love of your heart. God, thank you for loving us as we respond back to you in prayer and worship.